what I find is one of the most compelling traits of these successful, you know, entrepreneurs, business owners, investors is that they're so willing to give back, right? That's why you and I are here right now, because we want to give back the information that we've learned. We want you to learn from our mistakes so that you don't have to make the same mistakes and so that you can meet your goals that much quicker. So what I find, especially with the new investors, are they're scared and they don't want to ask for questions and they don't want to find a mentor, but you have to. It is so important for you to become a student first and seek out that information so that you don't lose money. The more information you have, the better the mentor, the better the coach, the more likely you're gonna be successful because that's what we do. We teach you to be successful. So if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Conner, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And on this show, we talk about how to raise private money for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. In fact, we talk about how you can get your deals funded without ever even pitching a deal. Well, on today's show, I'm so excited to have a very, very special guest. And she has actually raised over a million dollars in private money for her tax lien investing business. Well, she is known as the queen of passive investing. And she is a lady that has really defied all the odds and conquered uh, a childhood of abuse and of poverty and has just blossomed into a beautiful human being and has her own story and her own life. Well, she's had a very, very diverse career. Her career has been in banking. It's been in financial advising. And actually, she owns a top 10 REMAX office. She did that for over five straight years. And her REMAX office had over $2 billion in sales. But now... She is really following her passion and she's a hundred percent dedicated, committed, and focused on helping individuals like you create wealth through passive investing and lending to where you can get double digit returns on your money while you continue to have, you know, the business life that you enjoy. Now, she's also like myself, she's the host of a top rated podcast. It's called Empower Her Money which has got over 1,200 five-star ratings. Well, listen, in just a moment, you're going to meet my friend and my special guest, Angela Duncan, right after this. Well, hello there, Angela, and welcome to Raising Private Money. Thank you, Jay. I'm so excited for our conversation today. I am so excited to have you on here. You've got quite the background, uh, particularly with where you started from to where you are today. And so first I want to talk about, before we talk about raising private money, I want us to talk about something even deeper within yourself. And that is, you know, you grew up in, po in poverty. Uh, you had an abusive childhood experience. And, you know, there's lots of people that have gone through that type of childhood. What is it about yourself? How is it that you were able to climb out of or get out of that type of background and experience to where here you are today, very, very successful individual who is truly happy. You're truly joyous. I can tell that about you. What kind of mindset does that take? How did you do that? Yeah. Well, early on, um, I moved out of my house when I was 18. As soon as I could sign my own lease, I had three jobs at the time. I knew that the only way for me to change my circumstance was to take control of my environment. And so moving out of the house was the first thing. And early on in my career and in investing was really just running away from poverty. I didn't want to be poor. And so that was a driving factor for me. And I knew that I didn't have education about money, I sought out mentors, and it took me a while to kind of shift from that, I don't want to be poor, to 
I deserve more. I deserve abundance. It's possible. And what I can do with that abundance and help impact and change the lives of other people that have come from similar circumstances, then I have a responsibility to become a better version of myself so that I can get to a place and give back to that community where I grew up in. I love it. And that's what I'm about as well. It's all about giving back. It's all about making an impact. Um, it's all about, you know, being in a stage of your life to where actually significance is actually more important to me than the bottom line dollar to tell you the truth. And it seems as though that's exactly where you are. So shifting mindset, this is an area that you are an expert in. My question is, how does someone actually shift uh, their money mindset? You know, a lot of people have got an, an unhealthy relationship with money. Um, they, for whatever reason, their own experience growing up, uh, they have a negative relationship with money. They maybe think money is a bad thing. So what kind of advice would you give on getting that changed, uh, that type of mindset changed? Yeah. So really take it with a very slow approach. You need to crawl before you walk. And the first thing that we take a look at is what was the truth for you as a child? What were you taught about money? And you can think about very early experiences, right? Maybe you're at the store and you want something and your parent says, you don't need that. Then you start thinking, well, I don't need things, but you could have them, right? So writing them down is very important for you to visualize and kind of download them from what you're thinking about from that early childhood, write it down and let's first review what was taught to you as a child. And then we take a look at today because you're still carrying that information in your brain, whether you think you have or you haven't, most likely it's still there because you haven't dealt with it. You haven't gone through the exercises to be able to deal with that. So when we write down what was our truth as a childhood and we look at what does it look like today and you understand that that's not my truth today. Okay. Well, if that's not your truth today, what is your truth? What are you most fearful of, especially when it comes to money? And then we go through that exercise and I like to keep it visual. That's why I want you to write down what you learned as a child and what you think you want to know today and what you're, what's holding you back and where you want to go and keep it all visual for you. So I have a huge whiteboard in my office. It's like six feet. And I constantly am writing my thoughts down because I recognize that that's going to be the first thought whenever I'm conducting business or doing investing. That might be my first thought, but then I have a minute to change and remember that was then this is who I am now. And that's how you work that muscle for someone like me that grew up in the childhood that I did. I know I'm going to be working this muscle for the rest of my life. It's not something that I was able to fix. You know, I'm going to be 46 this year. It happened a long time. Those childhood fears but I understand that they're there and I know it's not my truth today. So I have to shift it and I've got to do the work to be able to do that. It sounds to me in your explanation there, Angela, that it really comes down to one of the first things people need to know is that they actually have a choice to choose. They actually have the power of choice and can really choose whatever it is that they want. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's the awareness factor. Until you're aware of what those early thoughts are, you don't have a chance to change them because you don't know that they exist. But once you become aware and then you can choose to have a different story, you can change that story of who you are and what you think today. Do you think there's actually something to the notion of actually writing something down versus, say, writing your thoughts on a Word document on your laptop? Yeah, absolutely. Many years of studies has been done. And this is why in the school system, they're still asking you to take a paper test or take paper notes or turn in a paper. Because when you write something down, you're more likely to one, keep it in the front of your brain and thinking about it. And two, it makes it something so it's more visual that you can have a tangible piece in your mind that you're going to change and shift that mindset. So it just brings more awareness to it. And it helps you keep focused on that so that you are continuously working on that mind, mindset shift. Thank you for sharing that. Now, the name of this show is Raising Private Money. So let's talk a little bit about raising private money. You've got experience. You've raised over a million dollars. Now, the strategy or the area of investing that you enjoy and that you do is investing in tax liens. And you've raised private money for your tax lien investing business. 
Now, it's been my experience, Angela, as I have interviewed hundreds of people here on Raising Private Money, the trend that I have picked up on, and this may not relate to you, but we'll find out. The trend I have picked up is that most of the time when a investor starts raising private money, there actually was a need. Something happened in their investing career to where they needed a shift, needed to find a different way to fund their deals. That was certainly the case for me in my story. So what was it that happened in your investing business that triggered you to start raising private money? Yeah. So for me, I was a real estate investor. I've been in real estate 25 years and I was tired of owning single family properties, trying to find a property manager that would great, you know, give great service, collect the rent, get a good tenant. I didn't want to get phone calls on Christmas about broken toilets. It wasn't a passive investment for me. So that was my breaking point. And I happened to pick up a book called The 16% Solution. Not my book, but it was my journey. It was another option for me to invest in real estate and take advantage of the real estate market, but to do it in a more passive way where I didn't have to deal with tenants. I didn't have to deal with property managers and that piqued my interest. And so I started to become a student and I found a mentor and I learned more about this vehicle so that I can put some of my own capital in it and, and start to see what the results look like before I could teach or you know provide opportunity to other people. So with private money, you know, you've raised that for tax liens. So there's all kinds of real estate investing, as we know. Uh, I mean, there's commercial, there's single family houses, there's self storage, there's land, there's apartments, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And you have chosen for your expertise and your focus to be in tax liens. So why tax liens? Well, the government always gets paid. So we'll break down what is a tax lien. If you own a piece of property, just like anything you named, commercial property, houses, condos, vacant land, all of those have a property tax that is due. So that money has to go to the government and they're utilizing this money for different aspects of their own budget, right? The government pays for so many things that they rely on that property tax from you to help fund their own budget. This could be schools, this could be roads, you know, whatever it is that the it was in their budget, they're counting on you as that property owner to pay them the tax that is due. What happens? Sometimes a property owner, either they, you know, had someone pass away in their family so they don't have the income to pay property taxes. Maybe they got injured or had an illness. So, um, you know, there's lots of reasons that a property owner might fall behind in paying their taxes but the government still needs their money. So of course they found a way to get around this and bring in investors like myself who will come in and give them the money that they need for their property tax and exchange. The government is going to tell me upfront exactly the interest rate I'm going to earn on that money. I'm letting them borrow. So these types of returns you're talking about are actually paid by the local government right? Mm -hmm. Once so, that property owner pays those taxes back to the government, they're actually paying the interest rate in the form of penalties. And then the government turns around and gives that money to me. Right. So you hear people talk about tax liens. Then you also hear another investing vehicle that's talked about called tax deeds. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between a tax deed and a tax lien? Yeah. So a tax lien essentially is like a piece of paper. I'm giving my money to the government. They're going to pay me back, hopefully, at some point in the future. And it's just a lien on the property. I do not own the property. I don't own the rights to the property. I just have given the government money to help fund their budget in the meantime before the client or the property owner pays back those taxes. Now, a tax deed is the actual physical title to the property. So some states will offer both options. Some will only do one or the other. But a tax deed typically means that the home is in the foreclosure process and now you're going to obtain the actual deed to the property and now you own that property. So that's a different vehicle, but both of them can be a great um, investment opportunity. So you've raised private money and quite a bit of it for your tax lien investing business. 
So when you started raising private money, how did you go about it? And what are some of your favorite ways to raise private money? Yeah. So for clarification, it wasn't my fund. I did find a mentor and a partner and they were more versed in the fund aspect. And so that's number one. When you're looking at any type of vehicle, you need to find a mentor or a coach, someone who's in the business, who's done the business, who has expertise that can teach you. Because especially if you're taking in money from other people, you could potentially lose their money, right? So I want to put my best foot forward as much education as possible. So I partnered with someone to help raise money for the fund that they had. And this was just an extremely great way for me to learn the entire process. But what I found the best way for me to raise capital is to figure out who is the target market for this fund. This example, they were telling the investors upfront how much they were going to be paid. So it was a set interest rate and what the payment schedule would look like. So I've got a fund that's paying out a percentage and it's on a payment schedule. Who is my target market for that? Retirees, someone who just wants passive income and wants to know upfront what they're going to make. So they're likely more conservative investor. And so when you think about who your target market that you want to help, I'm coming from an aspect of helping that person. How can I match this fund to the right investment opportunity person and put them together so that it is a win-win for both situations? So once you identify your target market, look around who's in your sphere. You know, for me, um, I have people on my podcast, I have people at networking events. And if I approach someone and say, you know, what is your investments doing for you now? What is it that you're looking for? And when I hear people say, oh, I'm retired, I just need the income, or I would like to be conservative and not earn too much, but enough for me to pay my bills. You know, that that's kind of my target market. And then when you realize what that is and how you can help them achieve their goals, it's no longer a sales process. It's just you connecting them to the right vehicle to meet their financial needs. I'm so glad you said that, Angela, because it's not a sales process. You mm -hmm. know, we talk here on this podcast all the time. It's not about asking. It's not about selling, persuading, trying to talk anybody into anything. We're actually providing a solution. Uh, in your case there, you're talking about retired people. Um, and, and, and I tell real estate investors who are looking to raise private money for their real estate deals, talking with retired individuals is a great market and group of people to be talking with because if they're retired, there's a good chance they've got retirement funds. And if they've got those retirement funds invested today, there's probably a good chance that they're not very happy <laughs> with the kind of returns or if they're in the stock market, the volatility of that stock market. And that's one thing that our private lenders absolutely love about doing business with us is because they don't have to worry about the volatility or the value of their investment as in contrast with the stock market. I mean, if they invest in the stock market and mutual funds or stock, then obviously the value of that can be less tomorrow than it is today. And what they love is they, the value remains the same. And as you said just a moment ago, they know exactly what the return on that investment is going to be. It's just like putting the money in a certificate of deposit at the local bank, but they're getting paid a whole lot more money. Yeah, absolutely. And it's taxed the same way too. So I love the education process when I'm sitting with someone who could be a potential investor, explaining to them the difference between investing in this type of vehicle versus maybe a syndication or their own, you know, single family homes. This is paid to you as interest and interest income in the current market that we're in is taxed at whatever your, per your current tax rate is. So you also have to plan with that. So it's speaking with your CPA or tax advisor letting them know that you're going to go into this type of vehicle and that you are going to have taxable income at the end of the year. So you can help plan accordingly. But the education process is so important because like you said, this might be a great solution for them, but we want to dive in a little bit deeper so that we can understand their whole situation, their whole financial goals so that we can help, you know, help them make the decision whether or not this is going to be the right vehicle for them. Now, Angela, I know that, you personally have experienced, you still experience it and you teach it as well as to how people can go about getting returns like 22%. So the question is, how can someone consistently, and that's a key word right there, how can someone consistently 
earn 22% on their money, on their investment every single year by doing this vehicle of tax lien investing. Yeah. So it's going to be a mix of the tax liens and the tax deeds because you want to balance out your portfolio and your risk. Now here in Florida, if you buy a tax lien, the minimum you'll earn is 5%. It can go up to 18%. So that's a great way for you to have the double digit returns just in that vehicle. But if you want to increase that and take a little bit more risk, then you're going to move into the tax deed um, investing where you're going to foreclose and actually own the homes so that you can either turn it around and flip it. Maybe you're going to fix it and flip it. Maybe you turn it into a rental, but then you're combining those returns together so that you can earn more money on your investment and kind of diversify your risk a little bit um, amongst two different vehicles, but relatively in the same space so that some of it could be short term, some of it could be long term, but that helps even out those investments for you. Now, another a way that you invest and that you also share with your community on how to invest, and that is in short-term notes. So first of all, define for us, if you would, what is your definition of actually a short-term note and how is it that you're able to go about and generate as much as 10% returns in only 90 days on those short-term notes? Yeah. So there's, you know, so many different investment vehicles out there. Um, there's businesses that need to have some short-term capital. Maybe they are off season, but they still need to meet payroll. So, you know, we can charge them that type of interest rate when we're doing a shorter term note like that. Um, there's commercial buildings that are being built and maybe they just need some bridge funding, meaning funding from now until the completion of the project those are higher risk. And so you're charging them a higher interest rate. So there's lots of different opportunities that can come together to help you earn that higher return, but they are going to be a little bit riskier. So understand that this is not typical for the um, conservative investor, but if you're willing to take a little bit more risk with your money, then you can also find other avenues in which to uh, allocate your funds and get a higher return, but you also take in a higher risk as well. Now, Angela, I know you talk about generational wealth and how it is that you can actually use tax liens to create generational wealth. So talk about that uh, for a little bit, if you will. I mean, you know, you're talking about short term uh, returns that you just talked about. Well, that's not generational. Um, how can tax liens play into generational wealth? Well, that sounds pretty long term. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where your life insurance professional is going to partner with me and we're going to but we're going to build a plan for you cuz you know there's many great books out there that talk about life insurance specifically a whole life policy or an IUL policy so we get the life insurance professional involved where we can put money into life insurance which you know, speak with your CPA, not a tax advisor, but life insurance can pass to your state tax free. It's something that you can fund up front. And when it passes to your heirs, it's tax free. So you can set it up to where perhaps, you know, your grandchildren want to purchase a house and they can um, they can uh, get a loan from your your life insurance policy without getting too deep into the details and then pay it back. So it's a great way for you to one, teach your children, teach your grandchildren about generational wealth and how to continue to build and pass it on tax-free. But another great thing about a whole life policy is that you can put the money into it and have the life insurance, but then you can borrow against it and put it into something that could be creating a double digit return. So not only do you have a fully funded life insurance policy to pass to your heirs, but now you're borrowing against it and taking those funds and putting it somewhere else so that you can earn income in that avenue as well. And then you can pay the life insurance back upon you know your death so that it does pass to your heirs tax-free, but it's a way kind of to double dip. But these are strategies that a lot of people aren't aware of because they don't have the proper professionals on their team. So that's one of the things that we like to teach is that not just about me, but we're bringing in the CPA, we're bringing in the life insurance agent so that we can build out the proper plan for you so that your hard earned dollars today gets to pass to the next generations, but also we can teach them how to keep that going as well. Angela, you've been blessed to 
work with a lot of new real estate investors, seasoned real estate investors. And since you've been exposed to so many of those in your coaching and your mentoring career, what have you noticed? What trends have you seen as far as common mistakes that new investors make when they start getting into this world of investing? And what advice would you give them to avoid those common mistakes? Yeah. And I see this most often with my female investors is that we don't want to ask for help. We don't want to seek out a coach or a mentor. One, we think maybe the investment of money is not worth it, or we don't want to bother them. And it's so funny to me because what I find is one of the most compelling traits of these successful you know, entrepreneurs, business owners, investors is that they're so willing to give back, right? That's why you and I are here right now, because we want to give back the information that we've learned. We want you to learn from our mistakes so that you don't have to make the same mistakes and so that you can meet your goals that much quicker. So what I find, especially with the new investors, are they're scared and they don't want to ask for questions and they don't want to find a mentor, but you have to. It is so important for you to become a student first and seek out that information so that you don't lose money. The more information you have, the better the mentor, the better the coach, the more likely you're going to be successful because that's what we do. We teach you to be successful. So learn from our mistakes and the things that we've already been through so we can teach you not to do those, but it'll just help you get to your financial goals that much quicker. But don't be afraid. Get out there and find the information, find a coach, find a mentor, and ask the questions that you need in order to feel comfortable. Angela, I so wish I had had that advice when I started out because the very first six years that I was in this business, I was relying on my own personal experience from previous careers, which was a huge mistake. As a result, I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. by making mistakes that I would not have made if I had had that mentor or that coach when I started out. So I'm glad you shared that advice. Angela, I know my audience wants to stay connected with you and learn more about the ways that you can deliver impact and significance to them. So how can my audience continue the conversation with Angela Duncan and your team? Yeah. So if you go to morewithangela.com backslash fire, I've created a free ebook so that you can learn more about tax lien investing and figure out, is this a vehicle that you want to pursue? So that is definitely a freebie for you. Um, I'm also on Facebook and LinkedIn is Angela Duncan is the best way to find me. But if you want to learn more about the podcast on streaming platforms, Empower Her Money is the name of the podcast. I love it, Angela. Again, be sure and check out and visit Angela at www.morewithangela.com backslash fire, F-I-R-E. Angela, what a pleasure it's been to have you here on the show and any parting comments or advice that you'd like to wrap up with. Yeah. Take that first step, get your research done and see if this might be the best investment vehicle that you have uncovered. I love it. Angela, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor. I'm so thankful that you decided to join us here on the show. And I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.